Roughing It by Mark Twain. Eckhart received us heartily, a pleasant spoken, gentle mannered creature. We sat in the veranda an hour, sipping English ale and talking about the king and the sacred white elephant, the sleeping idol, and all manner of things. And I noticed that my comrade never led the conversation himself or shaped it, but simply followed Eckhart's lead and betrayed no solicitude and no anxiety about anything. The effect was shortly per perceptible. Eckhart began to grow communicative. He grew more and more at his ease, and more and more talkative and sociable. Another hour passed in the same way, and then all of a sudden Eckhart said, Oh, by the way, I came near forgetting. I have got a thing here to astonish you. Such a thing as neither you nor any other man ever heard of. I've got a cat that will eat coconut. Common green coconut, and not only eat the meat, but drink the milk. It is so. I'll swear to it. A quick glance from Bascom, a glance that I understood then. Why, bless my soul, I never heard of such a thing. Man, it is impossible. I knew you would say it. I'll fetch the cat. He went in the house. Bascom said, There, what did I tell you? Now, what is the way to handle Eckhart? You see, I have petted him along patiently and put his suspicions to sleep. I am glad we came. You, we came. you tell the boys about it when you go back. Cat eat a coconut, oh my. Now that is just his way. Exactly. He will tell the absurdest lie and trust to luck to get out of it again. Cat eat a coconut, the innocent fool. Eckhart approached with his cat, sure enough. Baskin smiled and said he, I'll hold the cat, you bring a coconut. Eckhart split one open and chopped up some pieces. Bascom smuggled a wink to me and Pro offered a slice of the fruit to Puss. She snatched it, swallowed it ravenously, and asked for more. We rode our two miles in silence and wide apart. At last I was silent. At least I was silent, though Bascom cuffed his horse and cursed him a good deal, notwithstanding the horse was behaving well enough. When I branched off homeward, Bascom said, Keep the horse till morning, and you need not speak of this. Damn foolishness to the boys. Chapter 8 The Pony Express Fifty miles without stopping. Here he comes. Alkali water. Riding an avalanche. Indian massacre. In a little while, all interest was taken up in stretching our necks and watching for the pony rider, the fleet messenger who sped across the continent from St. Joe to Sacramento, carrying letters 1,900 miles in eight days. Think of that, for perishable horse and human flesh and blood to do. The pony rider was usually a little bit of a man, brimful of spirit and endurance. No matter what time of the day or night his watch came on, and no matter whether it was winter or summer, raining, snowing, hailing, or sleeting, or whether his beat was a level straight road or a crazy trail over mountain crags and precipices, or whether it led through peaceful regions or regions that swarmed with hostile Indians, he must be always ready to leap into the saddle and be off like the wind. There was no idling time for a pony rider on duty. He rode 50 miles without stopping, by daylight, moonlight, starlight, or through the blackness of darkness. Just as it happened, he rode a splendid horse that was born for a racer and fed and lodged like a gentleman. He kept him at his utmost speed for 10 miles, and then as he came crashing up to the station where stood two men holding fast a fresh, impatient steed, the transfer of rider and mail bag was made in the twinkling of an eye and away flew the eager pair and were out of sight before the spectator could get hardly the ghost of a look. Both rider and horse went flying light. The rider's dress was thin and fitted close. He wore a roundabout and a skull cap. 
and tucked his pantaloons into his boot tops like a race rider. He carried no arms. He carried nothing that was not absolutely necessary, for even the postage on his literary freight was worth five dollars a letter. He got but little frivolous correspondence to carry. His bag had business letters in it, mostly. His horse was stripped of all unnecessary weight, too. He wore a little wafer of a racing saddle and no visible blanket. He wore light shoes, or none at all. The little flat mail pack pockets strapped under the rider's thighs would each hold about the bulk of a child's primer. They held many and many an important business chapter and newspaper letter. But these were written on paper as airy and thin as gold leaf, nearly, and thus bulk and weight were economized. The stagecoach traveled about 100 to 125 miles a day, 24 hours. The pony rider about 250. There were about eight pony riders in the saddle all the time, night, night and day, stretching in a long, scattering procession from Missouri to California, 40 flying eastward and 40 toward, towards the west, and among them making 400 gallant horses, earning a stirring livelihood, and see a deal of scenery every single day in the year. We had had a consuming desire from the beginning to see a pony rider, but somehow or other all that passed us and all that met us managed to speak by, streak by in the night. And so we heard only a whiz and a hail, and the swift phantom of the desert was gone before we could get our heads out of the windows. But now we were expecting one along every moment, and would see him in broad daylight. Presently the driver exclaims, Here he comes! Every neck is stretched further, and every eye strained wider. Away across the endless dead level of the prairie, a black speck appears against the sky, and it is plain that it moves. Well, I should think so. In a second or two, it becomes a horse and rider, rising and falling, rising and falling, sweeping toward us, nearer and nearer, growing more and more distinct, more and more sharply defined, nearer and still nearer, and the flutter of the hooves comes faintly to the ear. Another instant, a whoop and a hurrah from our upper deck, a wave of the rider's hand, but no reply, and man and horse burst past our excited faces and go winging away like a belated fragment of a storm. So sudden is it all, and so like a flash of unreal fancy. And but for the flake of white foam left quivering and perishing on a mail sack after the vision had flashed by and disappeared, we might have doubted whether we had seen any actual horse and man at all, maybe. We rattled, we rattled through Scott's Bluffs Pass by and by. It was along here somewhere that we first came across genuine and unmistakable alkali water in the road, and we cordially hailed it as a first-class curiosity and a thing to be mentioned with eclat in letters to the ignorant <laughs> at home. This water gave the road a soapy appearance, and in many places the ground looked as if it had been whitewashed. I think the strange alkali water excited us as much as any wonder we had come upon yet, and I know we felt very complacent and conceited and better satisfied with life after we had added it to our lists of things which we had seen and some other people had not. In a small way, we were the same sort of simpletons as those who climb unnecessarily the perilous peaks of Mont Blanc and the Matterhorn, and derive no pleasure from it except the reflection that it isn't a common experience. But once in a while, one of those prairie parties trips and comes darting down the long mountain crags in a sitting posture, making the crusted snow smoke behind him flitting from bench to bench and from terrace to terrace, jarring the earth where he strikes, and still glancing and flitting on again, sticking an iceberg into himself every now and then, and tearing his clothes, snatching at things to save himself, taking hold of trees and fetching them along with him, roots and all, starting like rocks, little rocks now and then, then big boulders, then acres of ice and snow and patches of forest, gathering and still gathering as he goes, adding and still adding, 
to his mast in sweeping grandeur as he nears a 3,000-foot precipice, till at last he waves his hat magnificently and rides into eternity on the back of a raging and tossing avalanche. This is all very fine, but let us not be carried away by excitement, but ask calmly, how does this person feel about it in, those, in his cooler moments next day, when six or seven thousand feet of snow and stuff on with with six or seven thousand feet of snow and stuff on top of him. Yeah. We crossed the sand hills near the scene of the Indian mail robbery and massacre of 1856, wherein the driver and conductor perished and also all the passengers, but one, it was supposed. But this must have been a mistake, for at different times afterward on the Pacific coast I was personally acquainted with 133 or four people who were wounded during that massacre and barely escaped with their lives. There was no doubt of the truth of it. I had it from their own lips. One of these parties told me that he kept coming across arrowheads in his system for nearly seven years after that massacre, after the massacre, and another of them told me that he was stuck so literally full of arrows that after the Indians were gone, he could raise up and examine himself he could not restrain his tears, for his clothes were completely ruined. The most trustworthy tradition avers, however, that only one man, a person named Babbitt, survived the massacre, and he was desperately wounded. He dragged himself on his hands and knee, for one leg was broken, to a station several miles away. He did it during portions of two nights, lying concealed one day in part of another, and for more than 40 hours suffering unimaginable anguish from hunger, thirst, and bodily pain. The Indians robbed the coach of everything it contained, including quite about an amount of treasure. Okay, chapter 10. No, chapter 9. Among the Indians, an unfair advantage laying on our arms, a midnight murder, wrath of outlaws, a dangerous yet valuable citizen. We passed Fort Laramie in the night, and on the seventh morning out we found ourselves in the Black Hills, with Laramie Peak at our elbow, apparently, looming vast and solitary, a deep, dark, rich indigo, blue in hue, so Pretentiously did our did the old Colossus frown under his beetling brows of storm cloud. He was thirty or forty miles away in reality, but he only seemed removed a little beyond the low ridge at our right. We breakfasted at Horseshoe Station, six hundred and seventy six miles out from Saint Joseph. We had now reached a hostile Indian country, and during the afternoon we passed Laparel Station, enjoyed and enjoyed great discomfort all the time we were in the neighborhood being aware that many of the trees were dashed by at arm's length con uh, be being aware that many of the trees we dashed by at arm's length concealed a lurking Indian or two. During the preceding night an ambushed savage had sent a bullet through the pony rider's jacket, and but he had ridden on just the same, because pony riders were not allowed to stop and inquire into such things except when killed. <laughs> As long as they had life enough left in them, they had to stick to the horse.